I can't tell you everything that I, I can't be that specific, but I can tell you whoever comes to look at the work brings their perceptions to the work. Okay, I was born in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which is a steel town, in 1948. My family worked in the steel mill. I wanted to be an artist my whole life, so I went into the service. In 68, I was drafted. I got an early out of the service to go to college. So I went to school in Philadelphia, and then I transferred to the state school in Westchester. In the meantime, I got a job working on a railroad. I was able to work on a railroad in Coatesville, that influenced me a lot because I was working with steel, moving it around, and the ingots coming out of the steel mill were like neon bright. They were still, they were, it was cooling, but they were so warm and hot, you couldn't get near them. They were melting the snow around the railroad cars. The atmosphere of that environment had a big, in, it did have a big impact on me. Later I started working with a sign man when I was in school. I worked in computers before I went into the service, so I had those kind of things. In fact, one woman who worked saw me one, one, actually when I was, came home from school, and she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm an art student. She said, great, because I've collected all your drawings. But I must have been drawing drawings, and, and I didn't even know it. She's throwing them down. And anyway, she said, I knew you were an artist, and I said to everybody else, look at him. He's a damn artist, and <laughs> he doesn't even know it. But I had volunteered for Vietnam, and I volunteered for jump school. And I didn't know at the time that why I didn't get to go because I took all the tests. It was so tough, but I'm the sole surviving son to carry out the family name and they don't put them in harm's way. When I was really young, I thought, I said, I want to be an artist. My family said, you can't do that. I said, why, there's no future in being an artist. And I thought, well, and they, I started filling balloons up with water. And when I did that, of course, you keep filling and filling, it explodes. So I wet, the house flooded, just like it did in South Street. Everything got wet. But I thought, there's something going on here. So later, I took a, a flashlight apart, and I put it in a regular uh, socket. And I turned the light on and blew all the circuits in the house. And, but it shot a beautiful flame up of light. And I thought, ah, oh, this is it. There's something going on here. Of course, you know, there's no, I didn't know the meaning of the madness. I went, started out in another field and my family said, well, you should be going to biology and become a doctor. And I said, great. So I, I went into the biology lab and I got all excited looking through the microscope. And, and I said, you know, hey, look, look at this, look at this. And it stopped the whole class, you know. And the uh, teacher said, what's wrong? I said, look at this. And she looked in, she said, you know, she said, you know, you're, you're in the wrong department. I changed gears. Mm. And I said, you're right. And I, I went over and started making art, and that was it. We lived in, in, a, in a rural Pennsylvania, and all the cars and everything like that had lights. You get inside, the interior lit up. As a kid, I shot a lot of billiards, pool. And there's a really a beautiful thing about when you come into a, to a pool room and the lights are lit on the table. They give them a presence. The light gives that table a presence. I think that was very instrumental. Plus, as a kid walking across the fields, there was the Roy Borealis, the whole northern light thing. And it really happened down there. I mean, like the skies would turn all different colors at nighttime. I think all that, you know, and the light on the snow, and I mean, you know, you're a product of your environment. The mystery has never left. Students said, your whole life is about being an artist. I'm, I'm an artist all the time. You're, you live it. My, and my wife is very important to me because she's had to, she's picked up on some of my needs as a sculptor. In fact, when we found this building, I pulled up in front and I said to her, I said, well, I said, what do you think? Isn't it great? And she said, can you make art there? And I said, yes. She said, well, I can live anywhere, but I can't live with you if you're not making art. 
Well, I'm around a lot of painters, and I've always had an interest in form. And you know, I worked on old cars. I didn't, you know, I've always worked with my hands. And my my family are like crafty people. My great grandfather was a stonemason, so there's that kind of catch up, you know, like so. And also, it's you know, I don't separate the crafts that much. I my work has a lot to do with painting. All my friends are painters, so I like to look at painting. I like, I'm interested in color and form. And all the, a lot of sculptures were working with, with weight then. Weight was a big deal. And I was interested in taking it in a different direction with dealing with levitation and working with light and working with, you know, things that aren't so heavy, that have more of a, an airiness to them, more ephemeral. When you go into the space, the space talks to you. I mean, all we are are vehicles for the material. It's like paint has an energy, and you, as you're working, you're finding, you're finding out the, what energy comes back to you. It's not, a, it's not a selfish thing. It's a gener. You got to be generous to the material for it to come back to you. It has its energy. It has its own power. It's going to be here longer than I am. The situation is that you do a body of work and you don't know you're doing a body of work. In your process, go through a, a group of work and then you turn around and go, well, that's not saying you can't revisit it, but when you revisit it, you have a lot of a history behind you and you revisit it with fr fresh eyes. I'm really interested in, in the viewer looking into the piece. Flavin was into projection. Uh, you know, there are lights projecting into the room. You know, Terrell's the same way. I'm not that kind of artist. I'm an artist where there's an intimacy between you and the material and the work. You look into it like you're looking into yourself. This is a big family, and you can't, there's some twins, and there's some that are just off the wall. And that's the way it is with a family. You know, some things come through you, and you say, well, how did that get there? Whether it's a painting, a drawing, it's just done. I've never thought of these as objects. I just don't, I just make them, and they're objects, yes, but they're not just about being objects. They're about, you know, they're about something else that I can't explain. I think that being around other artists and hearing them and hearing their viewpoints, like I've been blessed knowing the great artists I know. Uh, Marty Keller called me up and she said, I want to nominate you for the group. And Marty's always been a champion to me in my work. And she's that way in the community. She's a, a very generous human being. And she's been that way ever since. I came here to be in the community and be part of the community and, you know, and learn. Like uh, education for me is a, con is a continuum. One of my first shows in New York she uh, it was a group show. She brought a collector in, and he, and he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, what are you going to do if I buy this piece? And I said to him, well, I'm going to take the money, I'm going to go make art. He said, what are you going to do if I don't buy the piece? And I said, I'm going to save my money up, and I'm going to make more art. People in the art world are short-sighted. They see things for the moment. You know what I mean? Especially, I'm not talking about the artists, because Art, you know, like I can name galleries and you won't know who the hell they are, but I'll name the artists and you'll know who they are. Art, artists and art live forever.